limp bodies of protesters being forced to move. Working with choreographer Amy Anderson and six dancers, McDonald studied and dissected these scenes of passive resistance in order to reproduce them using performance and video. McDonald notes that in imitating these complicated configurations of bodies, the intention is to hijack and re rewrite the power relations described within them. Annie received her BFA here at Ryerson University and completed graduate studies at Le Frenois, Studio National des Arts Contemporains in France. Recent solo shows and performances have been held at Mulhern, New York, the Art Gallery of Windsor, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Holding, still holding together is supported by a generous grant from the Canada Council for the Arts, and we're very grateful for their support. And then last note, please uh, note that we will provide a microphone for any audience members who would like to ask a question at the end of Annie's lecture. Please wait for the microphone to arrive before you speak as we are live streaming tonight's lecture on our website and we want you to be heard clearly online. You can find a link, a link to the lecture and the lectures and events on our website. And now please join me in welcoming Annie McDonald. Thank you, thanks Gail for the introduction. How's the sound? Is it okay? Tell me really, is it okay? You can hear me? Is it loud enough? Like that? Okay. <clears throat> How can an authentic response to the imposed disaster of contemporary life be constructed? The title of my talk today is a question I borrowed from the American artist Doug Ashford, who has been asking variations on it in the many separate texts exhibitions and lectures he's produced over the last years. I first came across a version of this question in Empathy and Abstraction, an essay in which Ashford tries to reconcile his newfound impulse to make abstract paintings with his long-standing political activism. Art and politics have always had a complicated relationship, and this is especially true, I think, when it comes to visual art. The problem with abstract art in particular, Ashford explains, is that it implies something non-specific and removed. It provides a distancing from real things and people which could also be perceived as a retreat into a safe self-seclusion. Self Ashford places empathy on the opposite end of the spectrum from abstraction. He associates it with naturalism, collectivism, and a kind of profound engagement with the world that's also called love. These things are fundamental to human experience, of course, but Ashford also validates abstraction as a separate but equally essential mode, one that allows us to, in his words, experience ourselves in concert with the world, unstable, experimental, and provisional. He acknowledges that empathy and abstraction might well be opposite positions, but if they are, he states, then they must be joined together and held on to simultaneously. The passage that strikes me the most in this essay comes about halfway through it. Ashford writes, if an abstract fantasy can partially deny reference to actual life, then maybe it can go on to offer another kind of solace, another chance for action. As the forms of actual life are forced to filter through the ideal projections of abstraction, life can be repositioned moving our concepts and our bodies into contexts of self-design. The proposition, as I understand it, is that we can use art to filter real life through abstraction in order to open ourselves up to new ways of being and thinking, which we then fold back again into real life. This idea was an important guidepost for me as I was working on holding still, holding together. The project is a multi-channel video installation which restages images of passive protesters lying limp in the arms of police. From the beginning, I had questions about the ethics of using these images, pulling these scenes off the streets and into the safety and seclusion of the gallery. But in my own defense, I didn't initially come across them with the intention of making art at all. 
You see, before I began to read Ashford's writing, I was also thinking about what an authentic response to the disaster of contemporary life might look like. More specifically, I was thinking about collective action, how it's been evolving in recent years, and how I might begin to participate in it in whatever form it's currently taking. Often I think through things by looking at images of them. So I began to look at images of passive protest, not as artistic research, but just to learn more about it. I, began particularly, I became particularly interested in a subset of these images, the ones that show protesters going limp as the police drag them away. Going limp has long been a central strategy of passive resistance. It's effective because it functions on many different levels at once. First of all, it's a way of occupying space, of claiming a physical location where you are not permitted or not intended to be. Ideologically, it's a gesture of total non-cooperation with the police that are trying to remove you from an area. This can be very empowering for the protester, but it also takes a lot of effort to move a limp protester. It ties up police resources by slowing down the process of removing and arresting people. Arguably, it also keeps you safer because a relaxed body bruises less easily than a tense one. And in theory, it should protect the protester from police aggression altogether because as long as you don't fight or actively resist, the police are supposed to match your restraint ounce for ounce, at least by law. I started to collect these images into a folder, but even as I did it, it was with a feeling of ambivalence and confusion. I have a deep respect for this strategy of resistance. I think it's amazing and powerful and effective, but the photographs and the moments they document are not one and the same thing. I also think these are amazing images. I've spent a long time looking at them and I'm still fascinated and moved by them. But there are many things about these images that I find problematic as well. One of the main problems is the way they depict relations between protesters and police, which is highly misleading. The real, street the, the real street protests were filled with chaos, tension, and violence, and yet many of these images have a serenity that has nothing to do with that reality. Also, these images do not by any stretch represent the standard exchange between police and protester. These photographs document instances in which the peaceful refusal of the protester was met with fair compliance by the authorities. These are events in which the documenting cameras were present, and so they are mainly peaceful images. But it would be wrong to think about these images without also thinking about violence. Most acts of resistance, peaceful and otherwise, are met with an aggressive response from the police, who regularly hit, kick, restrain and pepper spray the protesters. Sometimes angry mobs form around the protesters and deliver the violence on behalf of the police. Sometimes it's the protesters who are the ones engaging in violent and aggressive actions. Violence is too often the condition and the horizon of political action, and yet it's not represented anywhere in this collection of images, and that concerns me. Also of concern is the optics created by these limp bodies. If you were not looking closely or critically, you could almost mistake these for images of submission or surrender. The bodies of the protesters look pliable and accommodating. Sometimes the protesters close their eyes and look almost at rest. But it would be a mistake to imagine that this mode of resistance is derived from a sense of inner peace. In her essay, The Claim of Nonviolence, Judith Butler refuses to locate the power of nonviolent action in its perceived virtuousness or peacefulness. Indeed, she doesn't see it as an action that springs from anything close to serenity. Nonviolence, she writes, is not a peaceful state, but a social and political struggle to make rage articulate and effective. It is a carefully crafted fuck you. Butler's description acknowledges the fact that part of the power of passive resistance comes from its proximity to vulnerability and surrender, and yet it should never be mistaken for either of those things. 
It is a peaceful act that is born of fierceness and rage, and it is only with a great deal of struggle that the passive protester is able to maintain their vulnerability under the incredible duress of the street protest. I've worried that this struggle is not made evident in these images, and that has added to my hesitation in using them. But despite all these misgivings, my fascination with the images remained. There is something profoundly strange and moving in these different configurations of bodies. A big part of it is the play of submission and resistance that the protesters are enacting. But the simple physicality of this action is important as well, especially in a time when most people choose to express their political outrage through hashtags and status updates. The fact that these are actual bodies interacting with the police in a way that is singularly physical is what gives the images their special force. Judith Butler has stated that for politics to take, to take place, the body must appear, and these images are particularly moving ways to make that appearance manifest. Looking at these images, I find it impossible not to project myself into the situations. They force me to imagine what it would be like to lay still in the middle of all that chaos, making yourself soft in order to achieve something difficult and urgent. They allow me to imagine how hard it would be to not flinch or tense up, even as the police officers surround and outnumber you. The images also ask me to imagine myself in the bodies of the police. What might it feel like to hold the protesters in so close in order to drag them away? What are they thinking about as they are doing it? Is it possible to dehumanize and degrade someone even as you hold them in your arms? But there's more to them than the physicality of it. This interaction between protesters and police officers is a perfect articulation of the reality of who has power and who does not. In the images, the bodies of the protesters present as limp and vulnerable caught up in a matrix of strong and upright police officers who are armed and uniformed, mostly male, mostly white. Sometimes the protesters are being dragged viciously along the pavement, and sometimes they are carefully suspended above the ground. Sometimes there are many police, and sometimes there is only one. The police hold on to the protesters in a variety of positions that are odd and strangely familiar at once. This is what makes the images confusing. Sometimes the protesters look like they could be hurt or dead, and then it becomes hard to tell if the police are arresting them or pulling them to safety. Sometimes the police hold the protesters tenderly, as if they are children or lovers. This is confusing, too. But when the police are turned towards the camera, we can look at their faces to better understand. Often there is hatred there. Sometimes there is disgust or panic. Other times there is boredom, fear, or concern. Despite all these confusing variations, all the images show one thing beyond a doubt. The singular, vulnerable citizen caught up in the complex and powerful network of the state. The interaction, which is set in motion by the limp body of the protester, generates a diagram of the ways in which we are bound up together. What these images make clear to me, to quote Butler again, is that I am a being bound up with I am a being bound up with others, in inextricable and irreversible ways, existing in a generalized condition of precariousness and interdependency, affectively driven and crafted by those whose effect on me I never chose. Lastly, I am interested in the shutting down and shutting out that is inherent in these limb bodies. Through their stillness, their profound stopping, they are expressing their complete and total non-cooperation within the systems that exploit and degrade them. They are stopping because they refuse to continue on under the current conditions. They are performing a refusal so profound and total that they have abandoned action altogether. I suspect that there's potential in this action that is not an action at all, but rather its opposite. Benjamin once described revolution as nothing more than human beings on the train of progress reaching for the emergency brake. 
and the stilled bodies and stalled actions in these photographs brings that to my mind as well. In this time of amped up, networked cap capitalism, of more, better, faster, in which growth is the only mantra, these images show me that the act of stopping contains new and powerful potential. Withdrawal, refusal, and non-performance might just be the most authentic and effective response to contemporary life. Throughout the process of making this work, I've struggled to reconcile the many contradictions in the images. In the end, I've had to accept the good in them along with the bad. These images are partial and imperfect, and they make me feel confusing things. They don't tell the whole story by any stretch, and though I came to them looking for solutions, they don't provide any clear answers. But what they have done is allowed me to think through important questions around resistance, power, precariousness, nonviolence, and what it means to use your body to describe and enact your politics. Um, so what I'm going to do now is switch registers a little bit and um, talk in a more uh, informal way about the process of making the project and uh, watch the videos as, as we do that, which is way harder than reading from a paper. I do that. All right, so um, I spent a lot of time obviously thinking about these images and worrying about how to um, turn them into an artwork and whether I had the right to do that in any way. Um, and as I was thinking through the process and spending more time with the images, um, and thinking about all the ideas that I just um, spoke about, uh, I decided that the thing that was most important was to not use these images as, or not present these images or hold these images up as some sort of uh, resolved thing, as some kind of statement or some kind of um, uh, monument to something. Um, I wanted to try to uh, use them in a way that preserved all of those contradictions and problems um, that uh, were so fascinating uh, for me to think through and hopefully productive for me to think through. And so I came up with uh, the plan to um, have people, I didn't know who, uh, but um, people uh, recreate the scenes in the images. And I had the idea that what I wanted to do was to um, film this process. Um, and um, it took me a long time to figure out who would be the right people to do this. I haven't really worked with, um, with uh, I haven't really cast in this way ever before. Um, I thought about working with actors at first. I thought about working with students from, uh, from Ryerson. I thought about working with other artists. Um, I thought about working with community groups or uh, people that had been arrested during the G20 protests in 2010. I thought about working with police officers, um, and none of these things seemed like the right solution. Um, and then I started to have um, some conversations with a choreographer named Amy Henderson, who I had worked with before. Um, she's a, uh, an amazing choreographer, but also just like a really uh, thoughtful um, and uh, um, careful maker, and so we started to have some conversations about what it means to um, choose people to act out um, the stories or the ideas um, that you're working through. And in the end, I uh, settled on working with dancers. Um, for, a, for a number of reasons. Um, 
I thought that uh, the, the most important thing for me uh, in this process of shooting the restaging of the image was, was, the, was the working through. I really wanted to focus on um, uh, the sort of gradual process of this image coming back together rather than you know, staging this um, perfect recreation. This, I wasn't really after that sort of like epic wow moment. And um, I knew that dancers would have this sort of physical intelligence, but also the intensity and the precision in their bodies to really work deeply with the, with the images. Um, and, um, and I also thought that dancers were the right people because uh, in a way there's sort of a, a neutral a neutral body, if there is such a thing, because their profession is to, um, you know, use movement and, and and use their forms to tell other people's stories. Um, so, um, so with Amy, I we pulled together uh, this group of dancers, um, and we started to talk with them about the images. Um, I sent them the images in advance so they could look at them. I sent them notes about how I was thinking about these images and how I was hoping they would think about them. Um, it was really important for me, and this is also one of the reasons why I chose in the end not to work with actors, it was really important to me that, um, um, that the dancers didn't play, play the, think of themselves in the roles of um, the police or the protester or the good person or the bad person. Um, I really wanted them to just concentrate on this, uh, on this collective project of recreating the images and think of the bodies and the images as well as being um, neutral things. It's not that I wasn't interested in the questions of who's right and who's wrong and um, who's got the power and who doesn't have the power, but I was hoping that um, through the po process of reshooting that I could sort of like unhinge these uh, physical interactions from reality for a moment to open them up to other types of conversations and other types of consideration. Um, so, we got together um, in this very specific space, which some of you might recognize. It is um, the uh, former president's office, um, the university's uh, president, which hasn't been in use for many, many years. So. It's this sort of, it's a beautiful old room with uh, wood paneling and parquet floor, um, but it has seen better days. Everything's a little bit marked up and scuffed. Um, sometimes it's used as a studio um, by the students or by the teachers here. And I had also considered a lot of different locations to shoot these actions against. I had thought about taking it back into the street, um, to sort of return it to where it came from. Um, I thought about doing it in a completely neutral studio setting. Um, I thought about constructing a set for it, but in the end, this room to me was the perfect space because it had that real uh, feeling of um, traditional power. It looks sort of like a politician's office or a judge's office. Um, and yet, because of its state, um, that power has been um, displaced and it becomes um, a space, I think, to talk about those things and to hopefully to rewrite those things. Um, I wanted to keep this um, activity of restaging um, within a conversation about power and domination, um, but I wanted that space to be symbolic and um, I think I was hoping that the room would achieve that. We also used uh, daylight um, for, um, as our light source, which helped because it was a really long day and the dancers worked very slowly and methodically on these images. Um, and the daylight, I think, I hope, uh, s locates the action in a sort of real moment, a real time and place. Um, and also gives you the sense that um, that there is there is time that's passing. Um, so the crew was really small, and uh, the setting in the room was very calm and quiet. And um, we placed the images out on the floor, and the dancers decided on which ones they wanted to work on. And then um, 
I just ask them to spend as much time discussing and looking and trying things out and adjusting and failing and trying again as they did in actual formation. And they did a really amazing job of that. They worked away the images slowly and methodically just as I had hoped they would and they tried all different types of things and they negotiated among themselves, they switched roles, they reconfigured themselves. Um, Amy, the choreographer, was there which was really great because she had all the right language um, to help direct the dancers and I could concentrate um, a little bit more on the image. Um, a lot of the poses are, were difficult to achieve. They're deceptively, they look simple, but they're difficult to achieve and they um, asked a lot of the dancers physically, um, a lot of this lifting and dragging and holding yourself up. Um, and the dancers were all amazing to work with. So this was the, this footage here was sort of what I had in mind as being the main content of the show. It's what I set out to shoot. Um, but in the end, uh, the main screen in the gallery is uh, a different footage altogether. Um, at the very beginning of the day, we did an exercise to get the dancers warmed up. Um, and to sort of get them to uh, go through these experiences um, in a very physical way before we actually started to deal with the images. Um, so the, the very first thing we did at the beginning of the morning was, um, without the photographs even present, we just worked through the experience of um, going limp, of what, it, what, it would, what it's like to become dead weight, and also the experience of um, trying to lift each other's dead weight um, to drag it away. Um, and in the end, we sort of filmed the, the exercises because we were there and because it was starting to look interesting. And I had a hunch that we might, I might use it in the long run. But they're very improvised moments. Um, the dancers sort of played out each scene however they saw it. They would stand around the room and then somebody would step forth and decide that they were going to be the protester and they would lie down face first or on their backs or sit down or two of them would lock arms together. Um, and then, um, you know, the, dan the, the, the dancer standing on the sideline would sort of step in and um, uh, begin to work at dragging them away. And it was, it was a really powerful uh, thing to watch just because... Um, because of the physical intelligence of the dancers, um, but also because of the way that you could see them um, coming to an understanding of how to make yourself a problem and how to solve the problem of somebody else. Um, it made me realize how difficult um, and how dangerous um, and how tense these moments must have been in real life. And I think it gave the dancers a real um, appreciation for it too. In the end, like I said, this is the footage that became the main content of the show because I think it um, relocates the conversation in, in the bodies of the dancers um, in a way that I think um, articulates the ideas from a much more authentic place. There's a sort of truth to the actions in this footage that I really appreciate. And when I look at the two films now, um, the ones that we were watching before, the double screen piece and this piece, I think that the, the double screen piece is a much more intellectual exercise. And in a way, when I look at it, I see that what I had asked them to do was something that was very close to what I had been doing with the images, which is sort of looking, reading, being critical, dissecting, um, deciphering. Um, but all that action happens from inside your head from an intellectual place. And by contrast, I think this footage um, allows them to filter all those same experiences and questions through their bodies um, instead of their minds. And I think that really is where the action is. And, and it's where this act of protest comes into being. So it's important for me that this is um, the main footage. So this initial shoot happened in January, and then I took the footage home and I spent a few weeks thinking about it and editing it and worrying about it and imagining how it might be in the gallery. 
But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed that there was something important that was missing from it. Um, I felt like this footage succeeded in certain things that I had set out to do, um, like unhinging this gesture from its original reality, moving it into a more symbolic space, and hopefully opening it up to new readings, new rewritings. But something about it also felt a little bit too resolved and self-contained for me. And it, it no longer had all those troubling contradictions and problems that the original images had for me. So I had to figure out a way to reinsert that, reinscribe that in the project. So I arranged a second shoot. I asked two of the dancers that I had worked with um, to um, come in to my um, home studio, my little studio at home with a much smaller crew. Um, and the idea was to um, take a second look at the images, um, but instead of looking at the whole configuration of bodies, um, the, the sort of like grouping of bodies together to concentrate on the individuals, um, one of the aspects of all of the images that I found most fascinating was how so many of the protesters close their eyes when they're, while they're going limp. Um, it's an impulse that explains so much to me about their need to retreat into themselves in order to achieve um, the exact right state of mind to, to make themselves vulnerable in that way. There's a sort of withdrawing, a psychical, psychic withdrawing, which allows them then to become more present physically. And I was really interested in that play between their presence and absence, um, between um, this act of resistance that also looks like sleeping or dreaming or death. And all of these uh, conflations were really powerful for me. And I wanted to bring that back into the work somehow. That's how I came up with the idea of, of the painted eyelids. I had a makeup artist paint the dancer's eyelids um, with, um, with eyes. <laughs> and, and then as we were working together on the images, I asked the dancers to essentially to close their eyes when they felt like they had achieved the right pose. I told them to close their eyes when they felt they wanted to become an image. So the eyelids for me imply a sort of, or uh, reinsert that sort of impossible duality in, into the footage or like all those contradictions that are in the images. Um, but it also implies a special kind of interiority or um, a mysticism, uh, maybe an ability to see clearly without needing one's eyes to do it. And then beyond that, it also uh, references a, an important hinge in the structure of the overall work, um, which is this shuttling between still and moving, between photography and film, between reality and its recreation, um, and between abstraction and empathy. So that was shorter than I planned because <laughs> I got nervous and <laughs> skipped a bunch of stuff. So uh, we can do questions now. Hi. Oh, this is weird. Um, can Hi. you talk uh, maybe just a bit about like this piece has sound with it as well, right? From what yeah. I recall, and like it's kind of just maybe you just want to go in a bit about the. I think kind of correlated it with the eyes and like this kind of this kind of cutting sound, kind of like on and off. I don't know if you want to. Talk yeah, about that about. Um, the sound um, I worked on with my partner Alex Getty. Um, the um, when her when her eyes are open, um, she it's the sound of a protest. It's like a distant street protest. And then when she closes her eyes, it switches into a piece of music. So. For me, that was sort of like, when I talk about that hinge between reality and its recreation, between interiority and exteriority, that 
I was trying to put an emphasis on that. At one point, I had the sound of the street protest as the whole, um, this, this, the audio for the whole gallery, but I felt like that really pushed it um, into a much more um, uh, specific place, and so instead I uh, just paired it with this image. And the other piece, the other one that had like the, it was like a written, just like a spoken, was that just a piece, like text that you had written or was it a, yeah. a piece that you were reading from something else? Um, it was um, in, in this long process of uh, trying to figure out how to work with dancers and trying to figure out how to articulate my ideas through other people's bodies, I had written these like long and probably really boring notes for the dancers to read. <laughs> like apologizing in all kinds of ways for what I was asking them to do. Um, and then that, so I sent that to them before, um, before uh, we worked together, and then I kept working on that text. It's called Notes for Performers, and it actually became this really important part of the process for me um, in that it allowed me to unpack all of these complicated ideas and work through them in words, which sometimes is, um, is easier than working through things with images. Um, and so part of, so I, I was writing this text and then, but it was sort of always separate from, from, from the work. And then at one point when we had all uh, the work set up in the gallery, I really felt like there was this big hole where the text used to be and that it was no longer in the constellation of, of the project anymore. So, um, I decided to record part of it as a monologue, uh, a voiceover monologue for uh, the, Im the an another um, film that's, um, that I don't have with me here today of the images, all these images that I showed to you in the first part of the talk uh, going up on my, on my studio wall. Um, and um, I had uh, Sarah Nelman read it for me and it's a sort of um, series of propositions, almost like a visualization exercise um, that I asked, that, uh, that was addressed to the dancers, that was sort of like, um, and you know, going through all these variations, picture yourself as the, that allowed them to picture themselves as the police, as the protesters, what it would be like if there was two police and three police and four police and to just like shuttle back and forth between the experiences of the different bodies um, through those variations. Um, do you think it works as a voiceover? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I remember thinking it just sounded really nice. Like, I mean, it sounds bad. Like, I assumed that it was, like, a piece that had, like, existed before that you had, that had, like, inspired you to do it. So I feel like it kind of, it's, it, like, summarized it, I feel like, in a nice way. Thanks. Any other questions? Come on. Hi. Hi. Um, do you, so the way that I'm kind of reading the video um, as a reaction to the, the images is kind of a restructuring of that power. And when you were talking about the video, you're talking a lot about um, the way the, the dancers were interacting with each other and kind of this egalitarian energy in the room um, and that the performance almost seems like this collaboration between you um, and the dancers. So would, would you think that's a fair reading that it's, it's kind of a subversion of the structure of power that you see in the images that you sourced? Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the idea was, and I mean, like there's, like, there's all kinds of problems with doing that too, I think. But the idea was to take this thing that was entirely loaded, that was entirely descriptive of, you know, a lot of um, the problems in the world right now, um, or a lot of the ways that we're limited in our, in our actions and um, in our lives, um, and then turning it into... Um, a sort of neutralized collaborative action that had more to do with um, people holding each other and like figuring out how to hold each other up and how to pull each other across. Um, you know, I mean, part of the thing that's so fascinating about the images for me is this like intimacy that I imagine between the bodies, right? And it might just be me projecting and romanticizing, but, um, you know, I imagine that there must be so much closeness and intimacy and physicality to these interrelations 
which must be confusing for the people that are putting themselves in those situations that are living through it. Um, and so I wanted to sort of like bring that physicality and intimacy forward and pull away um, the um, negative power relations and just see what would happen with the action. Hi. Um, for the film that's in the main, the main hall, or I mm -hmm. guess the main room, why did you choose to overlay the footage? Um, I think that was um, partly in order to shift it into this more symbolic and sort of internal space. Um, and also because I, I really liked what happened when you start to pile the image up and then um, it becomes harder to decipher who is pulling who and who's pulling in what direction and then it just becomes this, you just sort of feel this um, sort of like interlocking of, of energies and efforts. And they sort of like, they, they're like these knots that are sort of, I don't know, like writhing um, together on the ground. Um, and I think it, when I saw the images that way for the first time, it really um, made it more descriptive of the effort and the pull and the drag and all of those things uh, that were interesting to me. What do you think? I like it. It's very effective. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, the dancers look so comfortable with one another. They seem to be improvising. More on what the choreographer did? Um, well, she, I mean, I, I never intended for them to dance anything, which is, I mean, it's kind of odd to ask the dancers to come in and, and not dance, but, um, and I never n needed Amy to uh, provide any kind of choreographic support. It was more um, just about um, like my limitations as a maker in that I had never really, I, I didn't know how to, um, you know, articulate what I needed from the bodies. I didn't know about like the politics of like asking somebody to do something that might hurt them um, or that might be hard for them. Um, and so I wanted Amy there. She helped me choose the dancers, which was really, really useful and helpful. And then she also was there to sort of like care for the dancer as well. I could pay attention to the image instead, which are, you know, they're kind of separate things and they're hard to uh, pay attention to at the same time. Um, but the dancers were great. I mean, they were from the very first, they were all in and um, they worked very diligently and I was really appreciative of all their effort when I was there with them uh, that day, but then in the months that I spent editing um, the footage after the fact, I, I really had a whole other appreciation for how strong they were um, and, and careful and intelligent um, with their reworking of these images. Really amazing. Hi. Um, so I'm kind of curious about the the sort of toggling between the archival still images and the the film images. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of I guess the you've spoken a little bit about the improvisation of the bodies, but even in the um, the last set of I don't know what it's called, sorry, but with the eyelids, mm -hmm. um, even in kind of these still images, there's so much motion and readjustment. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to why um, you produce videos opposed to um, reproducing tab like tablo abstracted tableaus or photographs. Okay. Um, well, I think initially the, the thing that I was always interested in was the process of working through something. Like I, I, like I said, I didn't really want it to be like 
everybody looks at the image and then ta-da, they do a perfect reproduction and then we can do a one-on-one -on -one comparison and you can make sure that they're doing the right thing. That was the opposite of what I wanted. Um, what I wanted was, um, you know, the looking, the trying, the failing, the adjusting, um, the sort of like working together and that is something that you can only really, it's something that happens through time so it's something that can only be represented with video. Um, but that said, I think there's also, in my practice, I, I've done a lot of this movement between still and moving images. And I think it, sometimes it has to do with just, um, you know, wanting to shift something out of its resolved place into a place where it's open for rejigging and reconfiguration. Um, so I think that's what I tried to do with this as well. Hi. Hi. Firstly, uh, the images are remarkable. There's no question about it. But I'm curious to know, have you ever uh, been involved in a protest? Have you ever talked to someone that has been? How did you get, I know you're a very talented lady, don't misunderstand, but you, they're so real. How did you get, did you get all this from the photographs? This part here? All of it. Yeah, I mean, I I've, I've, haven't been involved in a lot of street protest. And like I said at the beginning of the talk, the, my interest in the image was a, was a sort of way of thinking about how I can begin to participate in that world. And the things that I've done have been not very physical. It's been more like milling around, sometimes shouting a slogan, um, <laughs> which somehow wasn't that fulfilling. So maybe I was looking for a more extreme version of it when I was looking for these images. Um, but, you know, it's all the dancers and it's all their um, permeability and their um, intensity and their uh, ability to embody things. I mean, that, that's, that's what they do. I mean, that's their profession and I think they do it amazingly well. Yeah, the combination is truly remarkable. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you very much. The work is quite compelling. Um, I have a question about your decision to use this backdrop, this space. Yeah. Uh, I definitely understand why you chose it and the history and, and the power stru structures that are being revealed here. Um, and yet it also harkens a stage so much that... Oh, really? I'm, I'm curious about that and whether you thought about the possibility of different perspectives or if there's another project that you're dreaming up from this. Um, so I find myself just imagining the, the images of the bodies moving is so incredibly beautiful and I'm seeing it in all these different spaces in my mind's eye. I mean, obviously you chose this particular backdrop, but I can't get around this idea of a stage which sets up a certain kind of reading. Do you think it's maybe because in this particular footage it's just one shot, like the camera's totally static and it's just staying at a sort of respectable distance from the, from the bodies? Yes, and with the wings at the side, it's, you know, almost imagining a proscenium and this yeah. backdrop of a stage, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, but obviously, yeah, that's, that's in the images for sure, or in this, in this version of it. I mean, um, in the other footage where they're working on this, the images, we move the camera around and we sort of, you know, punch in for close-ups and do all those more cinematic things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, could, I guess I could, are you asking if I could imagine this on a stage? Well, I guess I'm just, I'm curious about the decision and, you know, uh, if that was conscious on your part, if, because that reveals other power structures, obviously, yeah. or if you had thought about it. And I'm thinking, I don't know why, I keep thinking of, I don't know if you're familiar with Alex Perlstein's work. No. Um, she does a lot of reconstructions of interactions of people in the round and the camera oh, yeah. kind of follows and you're never really sure where you are in the space. Mm -hmm. So it kind of launches the viewer into it in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm feeling that starting to happen with this work f for myself personally and mm -hmm. that may not be what you want at all. So I'm just, just curious what your, your thinking was around the static image. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I think part, it might partly come from, um, you know, all these eight by 10 photographs that we are working with too, right? Which were, were very, most of the time they were very frontal and very sort of like at, at, at a similar distance from the bodies so that you could see the bodies head to toe. But yeah, I think it could, 
it could potentially move into a different direction, but I'd have to let go of um, wanting to describe the images at all or recreate the images, which is possible. You mentioned sort of a sense of curiosity and confusion when you're confronted with the images initially. Um, was, like through the process of making this, was any of that um, resolved for yourself? Did you come to any answers or conclusions about the photographs when, or like the questions that you initially had when approached with the photographs? Um, I, I don't think I ever, I, I didn't come to any pat answers for sure, um, but I think mostly through the process of all of the writing that I did around it, I think I at least got to a point where I could enumerate the different things that were problematic and the, and the things that were exciting about the images, which I tried to do at the, as the sort of first part of the talk. You know, the sort of like physicality of the proposition, um, the idea of stopping as being very powerful, um, the confusion of these bodies being so close together, the intimacy of that. Um, I think those are the strengths of the images, and then the weaknesses, the gaps in the images are, you know, the fact that um, there is no violence. There's a sort of elegance to them. There's a serenity to them, and, and that's a problem. Um, but that could also, I think, be partly the problem of still images. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that too. You know, how um, documentary images always sort of have this feeling of inevitability because of their way they're composed and framed and how that is by, necess by necessity false. So I don't think these images are worse than any other documentary images, but um, it, it was um, interesting to think about the limitations of, of that mode of representing the world, too. If we're done, I, could I take two minutes to give some thank yous? Yeah? I wrote them down, but they'll only take a second. One more question? No, okay. So, thank you. <laughs> um, so the project was really, really long um, in the making, and I had to rely on a lot of people for help to make it. So I just want to take a minute to say thanks to Gail Morrell and Paul Roth at the RIC, who invited me to do the project and supported it um, in so many ways to Valerie Matteau and Eric Glavin, who uh, worked on the installation, and everybody else at the RIC, including Aaron, Natalie, and Anna. Um, I want to thank Amy Henderson, who's not here, but who helped me through the conceptual and practical difficulties of working with the moving bodies for the first time. And the dancers, I don't get to do credits with, with these videos in the gallery, so um, the dancers are Ben Camino, Simon Portugal, Luke Garwood, Kate Holden, Dana Rosales, Emma Kate Guimont, um, Iris Ng was my cinematographer, and she's always amazing to work with. Um, and I also want to thank my many friends and colleagues who helped me refine and edit um, and think through these ideas. Through, they were all very patient with me through many studio visits and conversations, um, including Chris Carreri, Jen Murphy, Leela Timmons, Sam Cotter, Fraser McCallum, Julia Paoli, Jacob Korczynski, Claire Harvey, Sarah Angelucci, and many others. And a special thanks to my partner, Alex Getty, who supplied me with a lot of my most essential reading material along the way, with critical feedback, with guidance um, throughout the process of pulling the project together. He, um, by choice, not by choice, I mean, watched every image, <laughs> <laughs> vetted every decision, read and reread and reread every word of text included in the show, and I, I couldn't make anything without his support. He's invaluable to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, our next lecture is going to be Angela Kawaholz on June 22nd. So please come back and have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>